Hello everyone, I'm Evan Hauser representing our investor relations team here at Atlas Motor Vehicles. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. First and foremost, this event may contain forward-looking statements, so please advise the legal prompt and stay tuned. You and I met a few years ago. Yeah, at Axon. Uh, yeah. When you started there, uh, did you think you'd end up here? No. Um, I looked at a lot of different things. Uh, I started with being an engineer. Uh, big, sort of hard, complex problems. I loved solving things that nobody else could do. Yeah. Uh, I loved it when someone told me sort of it was impossible or hard to yep, do it. Yep. Uh, and I think, you know, that first product I ever did, that 12 gauge, like think what cops carry, right? Shove it in a 12 gauge taser projectile, right? Yeah. I think that problem was cool because it was challenging, mm -hmm. but it's not everything I did while so I was there. So you went from kind of the taser side then to the camera side, which is where we first met. Yeah, and I mean, when you and I met, um, you were, you came on as a product manager. Yeah. And we were doing the second generation camera, first generation in card video system. Uh, and, but the, like, we talk about it like it's this singular product. Yes, and I think that's what was so eye-opening about that project for me was we were solving the problem, not building a product. And the problem for me, being on sort of the product development side, and uh, it, was, it was bigger than just like a technical challenge at that point. It was a market problem and like a, there were these like fundamental use case issues when you're trying to introduce something into the world that is like world changing. Right. But the market doesn't necessarily want it. Right. And you can't ask for compromise with the market to make that change. It, the solution has to be so good right. that it forces that evolution, that change in behavior. And I think I saw the same thing on the consumer side. You which ran we that didn't. group. I ran the business unit and we were able to grow it, but the reality was we didn't have product market fit. We weren't solving a solution. We need, yeah, there, there had to be a customer problem that we were mm -hmm. trying to solve or some value proposition right. that we we're trying to build. Right. Um, and I think that's what's cool about what we're doing here at Atlas mm -hmm. because it's not just about vehicles. It's no. not just about it's a not better about battery. Products. No, it's how do we make that difference? How do we like, solve for sort of this transition? How do we make people's lives better mm -hmm. in such a way that we're doing it through products that are maybe non obvious and what they can do? Now let's talk about how we're gonna do it. <laughs> All right, uh, for those of you that have never met us before, uh, my name is Mark Hanchett. I am the founder and CEO here at Atlas Motor Vehicles. And I'm Annie Pratt. I'm the president. And the two of us kind of have an interesting history, and you saw a little bit about that. We've got a history of building products that change the world. Uh, a little over 50 plus products, actually, in a combined 15 years of experience. And those products really were designed to take this user group, which used to be for us law enforcement, and figure out how do we build solutions that are so good that we make this user group that's hesitant, that doesn't want to move forward, excited about actually doing that. And we've done these in market scenarios that, yeah, they, they don't want it, right? They, um, they're challenging to get into. You're, you're changing the fundamental beliefs and behaviors of those particular markets. You're even building challenges within the organization that has to shift that particular mindset or that approach. And we've successfully done that. Um, what we learned was it wasn't just the product, right? It was the product, whether it be hardware, software, but really it was the ecosystem and the way that all the products work together and the workflows and the business models that supported it to make it a viable solution. And you have to do that without asking for compromise. 
Today, when we think about what Atlas Motor Vehicles is doing and what we focused on in the past, from 2016 when we were incorporated to 2018 when we raised our first dollar uh, through equity crowdfunding and all of those rounds after that, it was built on this premise that the most important thing that you have is time. And we built this product line and this proposal to the first battery pack in 2018, what we charged in 12 minutes, 47 seconds, to what we've done since then and building this energy focused sort of vertical around this idea that we're solving uh, problems from a solutions perspective. We're bringing a solution to market. We're not necessarily just launching a truck. Our claim to fame for years has been this 15 minute charge time, this fast charging battery tech that was going to make a true electric work truck viable. And that is still something that we are so excited to be able to deliver. But first, we know, and we've known this for years, we've got to build the foundation and the technology platform to make that actually viable. Now, when we look at the trends that we talk about today, I mean, electrification is hot. Um, there's a lot of players in that particular space. We do know that charging and infrastructure is a big challenge in this particular space. This movement requires that. But there's one piece of it that I think we, we know about, we understand, and it's still somewhat archaic in the way we think about that infrastructure. And that's the grid, right? So the, the energy infrastructure that supports charging, electric vehicles, all of our lives at home, our businesses, is that electrical grid infrastructure. And I actually live in Northern California, so I've got a little story. This winter, there was a storm, this happens all the time, tree goes down, we lose power for three days. How is it that we're in 2023 with all this amazing technology that saves people's lives and change, changes the world and that's an acceptable outcome? That seems like a problem that we could absolutely solve. And as we look at this particular future, I mean, we, we project a future where things like that don't happen. Right. Where energy becomes abundant, it becomes available, um, and I think, as we look at it from a perspective of what has to happen to make EV or EV transitions possible, and that's hard, there's barriers to entry there, of course, too, but we have to build something fundamental, something foundational. And we've talked a lot about batteries, um, battery pack solutions, cells, charging in 15 minutes, um, charging the actual vehicle, one megawatt plus solutions. Um, and it, it really sort of represents what Atlas has been doing for the near-term history, while the vehicle is still part of that vision, uh, we focused our attention on solving one of those fundamental problems. Now, from 2018, and the first time we sort of went out there and talked about who we are and what we're doing, to now, we've talked about these three pillars. We have the energy pillar. That is the foundational piece. All of these problems, all of these solutions, they require energy to make them happen. They require battery technology, energy storage solutions, charging, infrastructure to deliver that, to not just deliver, but to actually sort of um, create the energy, store the energy, distribute the energy, and deliver that to the end application. And then of course, there's the other two verticals. We've talked about, so the energy pillars, the first one, we've got the XP platform and the XT truck. Both of those are supposed to deliver, or we're excited to deliver, extreme performance um, and that 15 minutes fast charging. Those pillars also aren't changing, but what we're, our vision right now is really focused on executing on that energy piece of it, that foundational piece of it. With each of these different verticals, while each one could potentially stand alone, the other two can't actually exist if we don't solve the first one. So that brings us to why we're here today. Uh, Atlas Motor Vehicles is a brand and a name that has gotten us to where we are, um, but candidly, it doesn't quite serve us anymore. Motor Vehicles is limiting. People hear Atlas Motor Vehicles and they think truck, they think vehicle, but that focus and that greater vision on energy abundance and making the technology to actually enable this transition is not supported by that name. So, it's time for us to reveal something new. So as of today, Atlas Motor Vehicles is rebranding as new. Now, our 
our vision for the future is really, it's a fundamental shift in humanity. And we have to look at it from two perspectives. What would happen if we don't do this? Right. And if we don't do this, it's kind of the status quo. Things will continue on as they have. We continue to sort of try and solve these segmented problems of electric vehicles or charging. Meanwhile, the grid is struggling to support it all. It becomes pretty bleak. And there's these conversations around different aspects of this. There's products that are perhaps being launched around different pieces of it. But Atlas, or new, 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 that vision is built around this idea of a future where energy is abundant, it's available. If you think about a similar sort of idea or concept, we talk a lot about data. I like this example a lot because I think you say energy is abundant and available. That sounds big and awesome and kind of vague. But we all remember 10, 15 years ago when we were paying for a certain amount of data on our cell phones so that we could have more text messages, right? That thought now is archaic. It doesn't make any sense. And the introduction of affordable data, right? The right. advancements in technology, the continued advancements there and storage of that particular information has actually created a fundamental shift in how we transform information or transfer information, how we share information. The availability of data has created this opportunity where information is abundantly available for everyone. The thought of paying for data doesn't make sense anymore. You pay to share, to access, to utilize the data. Shouldn't energy be the same? And our vision of the future is built around a similar concept. We believe that in the future, and we'll call it tomorrow, but in the future, we will reach a point where the introduction of renewables combined with energy storage solutions, new innovations in grid and infrastructure and how we deploy that charging infrastructure, how we apply that to homes and businesses, um, to society as a whole, is gonna create a fundamental shift in humanity where we transition away from focusing on energy as this thing that we're fighting for, this thing that is sort of centralized to something that is more independent. Energy doesn't need to be a bottleneck. And the way we go about doing that is by really introducing our product, starting at the battery cell impact level. Now, this is a hard transition to make. We think about sort of our own use cases, and I think about mine. If I want to create energy independence in my home, I've had it quoted out. It's $100,000 to deploy solar and energy storage in my home. That is a non-starter in this market. I, I cannot overcome that barrier to that adoption. And it's what's the ROI on that? I'm sure they pitched 30 you years. on a 30 year ROI. I don't know about you, but 30 years from now, I don't really care today yeah, if you're I'm gonna have an ROI. Right, you're right? not thinking about necessarily 30 years from now. What right. most people are thinking about is 30 days from now. How do we right. bring value immediately within that first 30 days? Right, and similarly, I get asked the question all the time, given the space we're in, what kind of car I drive. Um, this is a little hypocritical, but it's not an electric one. And the reason is for me today, that barrier to going electric, one, there's an additional cost associated with it, and the experience of charging is a pain, right? That's a step backward from what we're used to with gas or diesel so far, right now. But this idea of energy independence, it's not just about your home energy storage, it's about having that independence as an individual where you just have the energy you need to use, whether it's in your vehicle, your home, your business, it's always available and you're just accessing that. And it, us having those personal experiences, those sort of personal motivations to do this, I think is reflected upon society as a whole and those of us that want to actually see this transition happen. I think now, there's some specifics too around, so you live in Arizona. I do, yes. Right? Uh, we talk about utilizing energy in, in Arizona. Your electrical bill is fluctuating drastically, I imagine, throughout the year. In the summer it's high, in the winter it's low, and yeah. having the ability to sort of have consistency in that mm -hmm. and availability of that. I mean, air conditioning, it does save lives today. Right. Um, especially here in the Southwest um, or other areas of the country where it's warm. But the investments required to actually make that transition possible, mm -hmm. we've seen these numbers, they've been talked about a lot over, especially the last few weeks, yep. 240 terawatt hours of energy storage, 30 terawatt hours of generation, required to actually make this transition possible and potentially $10 trillion of investments. Now those are big numbers. However, I would say those aren't impossible numbers. 
if you can build a business and build an opportunity where you can see adoption happening, mm -hmm. the investments in this make sense. And it really, there is opportunity that's been identified with this. If we look at the overall sort of market data that exists today or the projections through 2030, we're talking about a trillion dollars an opportunity across the segments of different energy verticals. So that's inclusive of batteries, charging, storage, trucks, vehicles, all together over a trillion dollars of addressable market by 2030. That's a huge amount of demand. And we've got these states that are making uh, claims saying, hey, we're gonna go full electric by 2030. The reality is with the current technology, we're behind. Current technology, current business models, a very transactional approach to this, and right. a very fragmented ecosystem of solutions. Right. Now, at New, we don't think of it as singular points or nodes of solutions or, or um, problems to solve. We think of it in terms of, you know, how do we solve this from a value proposition from end to end, right? From the creation or generation of power or energy to how we store it, manage it, distribute it, and how we deliver it to it. And it's really, it makes up a, an entire sort of puzzle piece of an ecosystem and challenges that we have to overcome. And while this may seem like a giant sort of opportunity, it is, we're actually breaking it down into some pretty straightforward steps. We need to generate, store, and manage energy. Then we need to deliver that energy. And then we need to scale so that that energy is available to everyone. Now to do this, we've outlined what we're calling 5% of the plan. It's first 5% of the plan. First 5% of the plan. But that first 5% is the most important piece of this. We want to take on that big chunk, but we have to do it in pieces. Our strategy has to be um, taking little chunks of that at a time as we grow and leveraging those chunks from a revenue generation perspective, as well as growth in the company and our ability to scale and deliver solutions in those specific areas. So while we have this very large vision, we are laser focused on executing on this first 5%. And that all starts with getting really good at building better batteries. From there, we're taking those batteries and we have two different variants that we're working on today, but we're taking those batteries and we're putting them into what we call cubes. These are battery pack systems that are fundamentally somewhat different than what you're used to in the market today, but they're available for mobility solutions and they scale to these grid level, what we call Q plus solutions at the grid level, as well as a long-term strategy that's really focused on how do we deliver that energy to your home, to your business, charging and infrastructure? How do we build that scale on a stepwise function in that first 5% of our particular plan? We're gonna get, as Annie alluded to, oh, and I dropped my mic. We're gonna get to getting really good at building batteries. We get good at it, then we start scaling those packs, those cubes, to all different use cases, and that gets us to scale in terms of actual production. So that's a very big deal for us in terms of the business, being able to build and produce enough batteries, enough energy storage capability, to then start leveraging that for this energy abundance. Now the next piece of this, and we talked about this actually very recently, a little over a month and a half ago, we had an a announcement around charging and infrastructure. We demonstrated megawatt plus charging a few weeks ago for the first time ever. <laughs> now what we're really focused on, and the next big step for us is getting that into the market. So the next milestone for new, is gonna be deployment of charging and infrastructure. We're gonna do our first deployment of a CCS capable system that can do 600 kilowatts and above. So if your vehicle asks for it, we'll deliver that power to it. I think no that's compromises. really important to note is that is more power than any vehicle on the road today is capable of, of taking. So we're saying we're gonna remove the bottleneck from charging. And then with each one of these verticals, each one of these launches, each one of these milestones that comes up, each of them is designed to get us into market, to be a revenue generating company, to start to create that scale so we can realize that vision of a future beyond the 5% and mobility, infrastructure, and energy that delivers that promise of abundance, accessibility. So now let's talk about a little bit more specifics around the cell technology. And what we're doing. And what yeah. we're doing there. 
So everything starts at a coin cell level. We hear this a lot in every company that's out there building cells today. Our team started at coin cells at Clemson University and inside our lab here. That's our chemistry team. We've got a fantastic team, uh, team here that's developing current uh, generation chemistry technologies as well as next generation solutions. And then from the coin cell, we go first to a single, single layer pouch cell. And then from there, we move to multi-layer pouch cells. Now, we haven't talked too much about this, but we're actually in mass pilot production of our multi-layer pouch cell. And that pouch cell actually has the fundamental characteristics of that cube cell, those huge milestone characteristics of a highly efficient thermal and energy transfer characteristics. So um, very efficiently transfers heat in and out of that particular cell very low resistance in that particular cell. That's really that step towards that 15 minute charge time. But that technology that's going into that pouch cell or what we call a P-cell, which is a multi-layer pouch cell that's actually going into a customer pack that we are building and assembling right now. That technology is then going to transition pieces of it into what we're calling a Q-cell. And I think what's really cool about the cube technology is we've identified all this performance um, improvement that we get from that form factor but we had this cool opportunity with a customer who said hey we want pouch cells and we said we can validate our ability to one scale manufacturing and work through a lot of the complexities associated with different pieces of that production process using a pouch much faster than getting to the cubes so that allows us to get to pack delivery for the first pack very soon while we're working to then get to this cube at scale. And that is so important because of the efficiencies that come with the Q cell. So if we look at the Q cell broken up, it's really just four parts. Well, four main components, components four main systems sure. of it, but um, or subsystems of it, but it's really, it's reducing the complexity of that particular cell design. How do we drive value there? How do we drive scalability up? If we can reduce the number of parts that go into a cell, reduce the number of steps and processes required to make that, we then reduce the number of parts and systems and components that go into a battery pack. That's creating value right from sort of the very fundamental kind of framework of every battery pack that's built today or that we're building. Right. All the way up through that final cube product. Less parts, less components, less areas where things can go wrong, less manufacturing steps. All of that means lower cost and faster production output. So this gets us to scale much faster and at a much more financially efficient way. Yep. Now, now go ahead, please, yeah. This is really exciting. So now as new, we are very excited to finally be committing to some big milestones this summer. So what you're gonna see from us this summer is what we were just talking about, Q cell production. So we'll be starting Q-cell production. It'll be low volume production Q-cell um, starting this summer. We're gonna use the batteries that we're building today, build them into cubes and packs essentially for our first customer to receive a new pack for off-highway equipment this summer. And we that's our actually- first pack in the field. That is a big milestone for Atlas. We've talked a lot about revenue generation and we have over two gigawatt hours of demand currently that is actually backed up by purchase orders, deposits, followed by LOIs and MOUs that sort of follow those purchase orders that we've announced very recently, I believe. That's right. So we're finally getting product into the field. We're recognizing revenue. And then we're also leveraging that cube technology in an energy storage use case for charging. Yep, so the next big thing you're going to see from us, the first thing will be deployment of that charging solution. So um, actually, we've got an event, and we'll talk about that in a minute mm -hmm. uh, this Saturday. But uh, the next thing for new is we are going to be focused on deployment of that first charging solution. We're going to test that into the market, provide that ability for you to pull your vehicle up, plug into it. We will deliver whatever energy you ask for all the way to the max, and that is a sort of monumental kind of fundamental milestone that everybody is screaming for today. If you've seen some of the reviews out there, you've seen some of the sort of tiers that people have, I guess, in terms of that infrastructure piece. New is solving that problem. We demonstrated over a megawatt of capability. So we're talking about the first one will be a CCS capable system that'll deploy in the feud. 
in the field, that will be a revenue generating deployment. We'll actually be generating revenue off of that charging component. So that's two particular products that we'll be focused on delivery of or deployment this summer that are revenue generating for new. So this is a big deal for us. We have finally gotten to the point where we're uh, in the foreseeable future getting revenue on the books, we're getting product in the field, and we're doing an event this Saturday for Earth Day where we're inviting anyone who wants to come to come see it for themselves. So we're going to have the megawatt charger out there. We will max out the charging capability of any vehicle that comes by for charging. And we'll be taking people through the products we're building, the ecosystem, and really the vision of new. Yeah, and we'll be here to answer questions and talk about sort of the vision of the future for new. All right. Thank you.